Christ redeemed in Christ restored. We keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until to the Glen Springs Church virtual service. It's now been more than two months since we last worshiped together, and we're so thankful that as normal life is beginning to resume a little bit at a time, that we can actually start to imagine being together again for fellowship and for worship sooner rather than later. Until then, we hope everyone is staying connected as well as possible, and we hope everyone is using these virtual service videos to help you continue to search the scriptures, lead your families, and grow spiritually while we're at home. I wanted to say thanks to everyone who has prepared and contributed to these videos, those that have led or participated in live virtual Bible classes, and a special thanks to Steve Wallace for putting in so much work gathering, editing, and making sure we can all have access to these videos. As we begin this service, I'm going to read a verse from Romans 15 and then lead our minds in prayer. Romans 15 and verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so truly thankful for everything that you do for us the way that you love us, for your mercy, for your strength. Father, we're so thankful that we know that you're in control and we know that we have hope with you and that you love us and that we don't have to do anything to earn that love, that you've loved us from the beginning and you'll love us till the end, that you sent your son to die for us so that we have hope of life in heaven. Father, we pray that you continue to help us to grow together, to grow spiritually, to be strengthened, to be encouraged, and that we can never take your love and your mercy for granted. None of the things that we enjoy so much that you blessed us so much with, that we uh, always remember that those things come from you and that those things are the truly great things in this life. Father, we honor you. We praise your name. We pray that as we go through this service together in our homes, as together as we can be, that it is... Uh, pleasing to you and that we continue to improve our relationship with each other and with you each day of our lives. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to 
to our assembly this morning. Let me join with Kent in sharing those sentiments with you. I hope you and your family are doing well. This is Memorial Day weekend, the beginning of summer. Yay! I know it's a little different this year, but it's a big weekend nonetheless. We have holiday plans. Maybe you and your family are going to try to do something special, uh, even though we may be restricted just a little bit. But it's still the beginning of summer. But isn't it interesting? At the very beginning of our summer, we have a holiday like this, Memorial Day. Our nation enjoys memorials. You see them all around. You can be driving up a highway, uh, pretty much anywhere you go, and you'll see a marker, a historical marker of a historic event that took place at that site. We, we can especially go around Gainesville and see memorials uh, everywhere, maybe even statues of great athletes who won great victories or achieved great things. And, and, and even in our homes, we, we have our own memorials. Your home may have been like mine growing up. We had that place or that little wall or there was maybe just a door facing where you had these little marks that showed how you were growing each year with a date beside there. There's, there's a remembrance, a reminder, a memorial, if you will. But truly one of the most impressive and greatest memorials when I think especially of this weekend is what we see at Arlington National Cemetery, the tomb of the unknown soldier. It's actually many tombs. Um, we have a soldier from all the great conflicts of uh, the past 100 years uh, buried here from World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea. And, and, and these soldiers didn't just die in battle. They died without anyone knowing their identity, hence the tomb of the unknown. And if you've ever been there, you know that there's a, there's a special feeling in this place. Granted, it's a cemetery and the tomb sits high up on a hill that overlooks Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. But there are guards, guards who guard the tomb 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And they march exactly 21 steps in front of the tomb, will turn and pause 21 seconds, then turn again and pause 21 seconds before they again march 21 paces to the other side. It's quite a sight. And, and, and while our nation is a nation established on freedoms and many freedoms, there, there is a freedom that you're really not allowed to practice at the tomb. There's no such thing as freedom for speech there. And here's what I mean by that. If you've ever been there, you, you know, you see the signs about you should be quiet, be respectful. And if somebody's not quiet and not respectful, they're, they're escorted away. You, there's no protesters at Arlington National Cemetery. That's what I'm getting at. No, no protesters. This isn't the place for that kind of speech. Because this memorial is different. And rightly so. And if you've ever been there, you understand that, and if you've ever been there, you've been moved by it. And if you haven't been there, I hope you get to one day. It's really, really an incredible memorial. And it's moving. It's very moving. It serves its purpose well. Our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father loves memorials. You, you find them all through Scripture. Everywhere you go, from Genesis all the way to the end, there's, there's memorials there. And, and each and every one of the memorials that's shared by our Lord has a purpose. It has a message. And, and, and the message is to invoke upon anyone who sees the memorial a reminder, remembrance, to remember what has taken place. But also, there should be a reflection. It should be an internal Reflection. It isn't something that you just remember a historic fact, but you, you reflect on this event, this message, and you apply it to your own life. And hence, it, it invokes repentance. To, to just 
get our mind back, get our heart back to where it needs to be. That's the purpose of our Lord's memorials. And then it should revive us because each and every one of our Lord's memorials, when you look at them in scripture, are intended to revive us in our walk with the Lord, to, to be reminded that it's our Lord speaking to us in this message that I love you, I care for you. And, 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 and almost every single one of our Lord's memorials speak of deliverance that I have delivered you and long for you. I want us to reflect for just a few moments this morning on just a few of our Lord's memorials, but mostly to make sure we get the message in the memorials. Let's consider the first. It's, it's found in Genesis, Genesis chapter nine. And again, I'm not going to hit all of them. I just want to hit a few. But in Genesis chapter 9, we find the memorial of our Lord's rainbow. You've heard that story, haven't you? Noah and the ark, and after Noah and his sons and his daughters-in-law and his wife are, are on dry land again, that the Lord established the rainbow. Here's what it says, Genesis 9, Genesis 9, verses 8 and following. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and to your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, as is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Gray and I went to a Gator baseball game a couple of years ago and just before the game started, as is the case, the rain showers had passed through and so we saw a rainbow and it was magnificent. Here, here's a picture of it. I actually got a better picture here. You can see the colors better. And there we were sitting there in the stands and all those who were there at the game as well were, were in awe of the rainbow. You could see everybody looking up and other people were taking pictures just like I did. And, and many people were posting them on social media just like I did. It was just really a neat sight. But I couldn't help but wonder all those who were taking pictures and in awe of the rainbow did they get the sermon? Do they know the message in the memorial? Do they know what it means? Do they know what God is saying every single time He shows us a rainbow? Uh, 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 imagine going back to the tomb of the unknown that somebody went to the tomb of the unknown for the first time and, and, and as they were walking away, you say, hey, what would you think of that? And they went... That was an incredible memorial. And you say, yeah, it was. And they said, did you see the architecture on the tomb? Did, did you see the marble? Did you see how that sentinel marched back and forth? And, and you say, yeah, that was impressive. What did you take away from it? They march really good. That marble is really pretty. You would go, what? You, you, you saw the memorial, but you missed the message. Because anybody who goes there leaves with the reminder that somebody died for you and died for this country and you leave with great patriotism and also great respect. The same is with the rainbow. We don't see that rainbow and just go, wow, that's a pretty, pretty display of color. And would you look at that spectrum of color and how it shines in those droplets of water and the sun reflecting to them? Well, that's no, you, you've missed the point. A sign, a sign is simply that it's a sign and it's pointing to a greater message. And the rainbow points to the message of God's deliverance. And so when you consider the rainbow, the rainbow has a message and the message is to remind us. And the Lord says, here's my reminder to you in the message. I'm making a covenant that I'll never destroy the, the world with water again. I did it once. I'll never do it again. And that's a reminder. There was a flood. There's also reflection. Why was there a flood? Well, there was a flood because men's hearts were evil. 
evil so much so that even after Noah preached to them for a hundred plus years, and, and Peter tells us that in Second Peter, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. But even after all that preaching and all those sermons, people still hardened their hearts and God eventually had to cleanse the earth. But yet the rainbow also represents grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And Noah and his family were delivered. And, and it's a covenant. And there's a reflection of a covenant that our Heavenly Father had made with Noah and all creatures on the earth. And so there should be a repentance. Noah, every time you see this rainbow, <laughs> set your heart right. Remember who I am. And so there should be a revival. I'm the God who loves you. I'm the God who's with you. And may this revive your heart to walk with me. That, that's the message in a rainbow. The memorial has a message. Another memorial to consider, and you probably have studied this one before as well, is the Passover. Robert Ganey spoke to us about this just a couple of weeks ago in a table talk. But the Passover feast that we find in Exodus chapter 12 was a memorial feast. It wasn't a feast to just come and celebrate eating and have a great scrumptious meal, uh, lamb chops. It was a reminder. A reminder of God's deliverance from death. The children of Israel are in captivity. They're in slavery by Egypt. And, and, and there's one more plague, one more plague that the Lord is going to use to soften the heart of Pharaoh so he'll finally release those slaves. And that's a plague of death to protect the Israelites and any who would listen. God said, take a lamb and you know, put the blood up on the doorpost and commemorate this feast. In Exodus 12 in Exodus 12 and in verses 26 and following, the Lord said, this is the purpose. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service or this memorial? You say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. What do we see here? Well, we see remembrance that every single time, every single time Israel would participate in this feast and they did it annually. They remember the deliverance from death. They, they remember the blood that is covered on the doorpost and that the Lord passes over those who have the covering of blood. And there should be a reflection there. A reflection upon the deliverance and the salvation of the Lord that the Lord sees us when we are in captivity. And He always offers a way to escape. And that, that deliverance comes through blood. So there should be always repentance. Every year an Israelite was to partake of this feast, there should be a repentance, a reminder that a price was paid for this freedom that blood was shed so that we would escape not just slavery, but escape death. And it should rekindle a love for the Heavenly Father who provided the plan, who provided the grace, who extended a sacrifice of love, the power of God to set us free. There's a message in the memorial. It's not just dinner. It's not just the idea to follow some religious uh, ordinance. And, and God never set up the memorials that way just to give man something to do to see if he would be faithful, to make him dress in the traveling clothes and cook the lamb a certain way and do all these other things that were part of the memorial. It, it wasn't about to test obedience. But it was to stir the heart, to revive and rekindle the heart of the Israelites to follow the Lord. Uh, uh, one more, one more. I just want to point at you. And again, there's many others we could turn to and I'm actually taking a few and putting them all in the same box here. But the memorial stones that you see in the Old Testament. Isaac. 
Isaac, when he comes face to face in heaven and has that heavenly vision, he's going he's gonna to set up a stone and he's going to call this place Bethel. Bethel meaning a house of worship. This is where he worshiped the Lord and came face to face with the Lord's glory. Joshua and Joshua 4. As he's leading the children of Israel into that promised land and they cross over through the Jordan Sea on dry ground, just like they escaped Egypt through the dry ground of the Red Sea. Joshua says we're going to put stones up, 12 stones for all 12 tribes. All 12 tribes were unified together as they went into this land that God gave them. And so when your children see this monument of 12 stones, they'll know this was the place. This was the place they crossed over. And then in 1 Samuel 7, Samuel, after the ark is recaptured from the hand of the Philistines and brought back into the land of Israel and the Philistines are defeated. In 1 Samuel 7, Samuel will build a stone of remembrance. The Ebenezer is built. That's what Ebenezer means, a stone of help. To remind the people that every time you see this stone, every time you see this memorial, there's a message there. And so what you see in these stones is a reminder, a reminder of coming coming face to face to God, a house of worship, a, a, a reminder of where we crossed over into the dry ground or into the promised land on dry ground, a, a reminder of God's help even when the enemy was pressing in. And so there should be some reflection. There should certainly be some repentance. I, I can often wonder if, if Israel had really paid attention to that Ebenezer more, would they have asked for a king in the very next chapter? Uh, of what you see in 1 Samuel. But the memorial, the memorial was to stir the heart, to turn always back to God. And, and God knows we need that. That's why He put the memorials in here. He knew we would need reminders. He knew that we needed to get our eyes fixed so that we would see something that would rekindle that flame and revive our spirit. All these memorials, all these memorials are a heavenly father who's saying, I love you. Look at what I'm providing for you. See the joy and the peace that I offer you, the covenant and the help that comes from when you walk with me. So how does this relate to us? Well, there's a message in each and every one of these memorials and really what you find when you go through all these stories, many of these stories really in the Old Testament is they all have a message and they're pointing, just like a sign does. When you see a sign on a highway, it's pointing to something else. It's pointing you to a business, a restaurant. It's pointing you to a message. It's pointing you to a warning. In the Old Testament, it, it all points to Jesus. In a way, the cross of our Lord is like the rainbow. It reminds us of grace and of a covenant. It reminds us of love and of freedom. But the cross also represents judgment. It represents a cleansing. Jesus and the cross, in a way, are a lot like a rainbow in that respect. Not, not that we were going to see it or we have to have some architecture or some art form or, or symbol for us, but we, we, we see it when we look in Scripture. We see it when we reflect upon who our Lord is. And even as we gather this morning, we, we should be seeing the cross in our hearts and remembering the covenant of our Lord. Up uh, Passover. I mean, here in a moment, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. <laughs> There's clearly, clearly a relation between the Passover and the Lord's Supper feast. As John the Baptist would say when he saw Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Sin of the world, John 1.29. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5.7, Jesus is our Passover Lamb crucified for us. Points to Jesus. 
Even the stones, if you will, will point to Jesus. He's our Bethel. You're in your home right now. You may not be here. We're all not here together, but we still have our Bethel. Our Bethel is when we're worshiping the Lord and together with the Lord saints. Even if just a few, we're worshiping our Lord together. It has become, even if you're by yourself this morning, that is your Bethel, your house of worship. It's a reminder. And, and, and in a way, we're, we're all living stones. The, 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 the memorial sometimes is what we see in other Christians. They are a stone, a reminder of God's deliverance. And they stir our hearts as well. In the church, as Peter will say, we are living stones. We're part of the temple of our Lord. And Jesus clearly is our Ebenezer. <laughs> He's our stone of help. He's our reminder. And this morning when you take the Lord's Supper, that that is the memorial for the children of God today. And, and, and it brings to mind not just remembrance and reflection, repentance and revival, but it should bring to mind resolve. Resolve. That's what a memorial ultimately does. It strengthens our resolve. You can't help but when you go to the tomb of the unknown to be impressed, to be moved, it serves its purpose well. There's a soldier in the tomb and he has a message. I love this country. I love this country so much I died for this country. Gave it all I had. And I gave all I had without any recognition, without any fame, without any accolades. I even gave up my name so you wouldn't even remember who I was. But it's worth it. This country's worth it in that respect. It's moving. It's moving. There's a message in that memorial. But more importantly, even greater is the memorial of our Lord. Our Lord Jesus the next time you see a rainbow, I want you to soak it in. Enjoy the beauty. But don't miss the message. And this morning when you partake of the Lord's Supper, especially, that's the memorial. Soak it in. Soak it in. They aren't just emblems. They're preaching a message from our Heavenly Father. I'm here. I'm offering myself. I've given myself. I, make a co I made a covenant with you. Let's walk together. The resolve. The resolve that we all need to have in our heart when we listen to the memorial message of our Lord. His body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. And as we drink, we see the blood until Good morning, Glen Springs Church family. Let's pre prepare our minds and hearts for the Lord's Supper. The bread represents Christ's body, broken to make us whole. The cup of, of juice represents Christ's blood, given as a payment of our sins. As we understand teaching of Scripture on the subject of the Lord's Supper, 
There's nothing magical happening in the elements, either as we pray or the partake of them. They remain simply bread and juice. And yet, there is something more going on, something very special. Because whenever we respond to the Lord Jesus in faith, he meets us with, with his grace. Salvation, the lost courage, the fearful wisdom for the perplexed rest and the weary, the joy of the brokenhearted, and on and on. I'm going to read from Scripture, 1 Corinthians, starting uh, chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, and which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and just give you all the praise and glory and thankfulness for the, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, dying on a cross for our sins. Lord, uh, the, the beaten body was beyond suffering for us. That we're non-worthy. Non In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, the new covenant, in, in my blood to do. As often as you drink, it remembers of me. Let's pray for the cup. Dear and Father, Lord, the shed of this blood is to wash away our sins. Lord, we are a sinful people, and I, I pray that you forgive us always. Thank you for being such a graceful, loving, caring God. Thank you for giving your son Jesus Christ on this, the cross, shedding this blood for us and the chance that we might spend eternity with you. I pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, brethren. It's good to be with you, even if it's in this format. 
but we know that uh, everyone seems to be doing well and uh, there is a lot of uh, distancing interaction and we're very pleased about that. We want to talk to you just a little bit about uh, our plans for the future. We met last night at Four Elders and discussed at length what we should be doing as far as the assembly is concerned. Uh, we have a lot of concerns. Uh, we know that in society today, we are at phase one, at least in this area. If you go throughout the country, they're in so many different phases. Uh, we can't be too terribly concerned about what's happening everywhere else, but it's just what's happening here. We've been told that we can gather uh, businesses are at a 50% capacity at this present time. And they've said that buildings can be occupied up to 50%, even though it's not a business. Uh, in our congregation, with this building, that would be about 150 people. As elders, we're continuing to be very concerned about the virus and its effects. We're very concerned that 150 people in this auditorium worshiping together, although we're trying to socially distance uh, and not touch one another, wearing masks potentially uh, to sing, uh, we don't feel that this is the best atmosphere for this congregation. We know a lot of uh, churches are opening and each of them are trying to handle this a little bit differently, but we're concerned about Glen Springs and what's best for us. So. The virus is real. We don't think this, this is a conspiracy. We don't think this is a ruse. We don't think that this is the government uh, trying to put one over on us. We, we believe in this virus and its effect and its devastating effect. We're concerned that if we open up and start meeting even at a 50% capacity, that the virus could be here and that could affect us. And we really don't want that for our brethren. If one person comes into this assembly that's infected, that means potentially everyone who's in that assembly is quarantined for 14 days. Uh, and that would be devastating to a lot of our people who are in fact still working. So we're trying to keep all of these things in mind. In sanitizing this place, in between worships, if we had two on Sunday, let's say, uh, how do we sanitize? How long will that take? What are we sanitizing? We just think conservatively, it's very likely better for us uh, to consider this on a monthly basis. And, and so we're saying in June, we will not be meeting at this building. Uh, we will be as elders meeting and talking about what we're gonna do in July, what we're gonna do in August. But right now, based upon the things that we have been saying and wanting to be conservative, uh, we're not going to meet uh, this coming June at this building. We're going to continue our virtual worship services. We're, and we're thankful we have that. We have the technology to do that. We know that not assembling is not good, but we also know that we're in a trying time uh, of disease. And, and I think we need to be careful about overextending ourselves and coming back too quickly. Now we did talk about possibly meeting at different times and different places, even for singing. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, we're exploring all the possibilities of potential venues and manners in which we may have some open air gatherings of individuals of a reasonable size. We're, we're looking at every option that we have. As Mark said, we're following as best we can the best medical uh, evidence that uh, is available to us in terms of going forward. We are trying to make the best decision uh, at the moment, and that's going to be ever-changing. We don't want to be the first people to step forward uh, if it's unwise or the last uh, necessarily when uh, we could be gathering because we miss all of you terribly. But from a practical standpoint, and we've looked at our, our building and options and all that would be required for a gathering now, we believe this is the best method for us to gather together and to stay in contact. We know that small groups are gathering on the Lord's Day as we 
uh, our uh, gathering in this uh, remote uh, broadcast method, and we're grateful for that. We're going to continue to look at every option that is available to us, continue to encourage each other. That will continue even after some gatherings are permitted. We're going to still have available for you the uh, broadcasts and other ways of keeping in contact with the brethren for those who may either be vulnerable or simply uh, do not feel that they can meet safely at this time. We're going to make all of the options available uh, for the good of the congregation. All of those things have to be considered. Uh, the health of our, uh, our members are so important to us and we vary from two days old practically to uh, in the 90s. And we have to be careful for every one of these members. Uh, many people are at higher risk and we understand that. And we also understand that if we made worship available or an assembly available, many people out of conscience sake would say, well, we've got to be there. And we appreciate that. We understand that. What we're trying to do is minimize those risks um, minimize people having to make those kind of decisions. And until it's really safe for a number of us to get back together, what we're gonna to try to do or continue to do is our virtual worship services uh, and be careful uh, about meeting together. We just, we know this is a terrible time. We know that uh, this is a difficult time, but we're trying to make the best as elders for this congregation as to do what's best for us. Brethren, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, stay in contact with each other, encourage one another, rejoice in the Lord. Uh, this is uh, in many ways, not only is it difficult for us uh, as a congregation and how we try to function, I know that many of you have missed out on some uh, wonderful events and opportunities. Uh, sometimes it's been also a, even a matter of uh, employment and other issues that people are suffering the effects of this. Uh, it, it's touched every one of us in some way uh, and, and cost us something. Uh, nevertheless, as we talked about memorials today, the Lord uh, has given all through the earth remembrances of his presence. For us, this is a time as we hear what should be the, a trumpet sound for us uh, whenever events like this take place. Believers in the Lord, believing that he is in control, uh, that he is the one who rules over the earth, then for us, we're going to humble ourselves before him, seek his help, and we're going to draw near to God. We're going to draw our families near to him. And we're going to call on the Lord for his help, for his uh, uh, comfort, encouragement, but to tell him that we continue to trust in his plan for the world. So this morning, as we remember him in the Lord's Supper, uh, as we think about the church on the earth today, as we look at the world in which we live, and see the evidence of God's handiwork all around, let us remember that God is on the throne. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, this Lord's day. We thank you, Father, for all of the blessings and provisions for your people uh, that continue to support and encourage us in a very difficult time. And we pray, Father, in all humility that you would look down upon us with favor that our decisions will be wise one, whether it is about our congregational efforts or whatever we're doing individually, that will be pleasing to you. But most importantly, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We uh, tell you, Lord, that we are penitent in our hearts of any evil in our lives. We are wanting to serve you from the heart. We're not discouraged by these events in terms of our confidence and trust in you, but we draw near to your shield of protection. We come close under your arm today and ask you, Lord, to please be with your people. And we pray, Father, a blessing for all the earth, that your will may be done in all things. For it's in the name of the Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Channels only, blessed Master, 
but with all your wondrous power flowing through us you can use us every day and 